thanking the organizers for having me. Uh, I, as a grad student, as an undergraduate, I really got interested in economics and in development economics specifically by when I was at Cornell by reading a lot of the wider reports. They're just fascinating and there were books that were just super influential to me. So it's a particular honor uh, to be here. I want to start um, today talking about uh, a body of research that I've been carrying on for a while now, maybe about three, four years, and which has, um, I think for me, dramatically changed my own understanding of poverty. And I think a way to understand this research, maybe I'll give you like 30 seconds of background. I think when I first started thinking about behavioral economics and poverty, the idea that I was resisting was there's a long literature that may not have called itself psychology and poverty, but which pretty much was psychology and poverty, and which basically made the following argument. The poor are myopic. The poor are you know, oriented towards the present. The poor screw up a lot. That's basically, to a first approximation, a long literature. And this literature goes back quite a while, actually. If you look at uh, uh, philosophers talking about it in the 19th century, social Darwinism, it's basically what I was resisting. And so my early work in this area was of the type of arguing the poor are really no different than anybody else, the same psychology, but that same psychology may look different or may prove more ch challenging in certain environments of poverty. I think since then, I've kind of decided I was somewhat wrong about that. And this is going to be my argument to you that, in fact, the poor are different and that there is something specific to poverty that does evoke its own psychology. Um, so let's start with that. So the first thing I want you to start with is to introspect a little bit about the following thought experiment. And this, so one way to understand what it means to be poor is to understand something that many of you will have a deeper insight about, which is what it means to be well off. Okay? So picture you go with a friend to a restaurant. You're not, you don't normally order cocktails, but while you're waiting for the meal, the, b before you order, the waitress says, oh, we have some special cocktails available. One of them strikes you as maybe interesting. Hopefully it doesn't look like this. Um, and you say, oh, maybe I should order it. Then you go through a little logic in your head. You ask yourself a set of questions about whether you should order this. What are some of the questions you might ask yourself? Am I going to drive home? Am I going to, you know, maybe you're on a diet, so you say, oh, is this a lot of calories? You might ask yourself what the price is. You might ask yourself, am I going to be drinking alone, or will my friend also be ordering a cocktail? There are a lot of questions we ask as we go through this decision-making task. But there's one question that you probably don't ask, which the poor often ask in a situation like this. And that question is, if I buy this cocktail, what will I not buy? Isn't that funny? You don't actually face a trade-off. You face a choice, but not a trade-off. Because in your mind, when you make a $10 purchase or a $5 purchase or a $20 purchase, those are not trade-offs. You have infinite amounts of $10 bills, $20 bills in your mind. Picture yourself going for a jog in the morning. You come back and you realize, oh, the $20 I had in my pocket, I, I fell out somewhere during the jog. You might be annoyed at yourself. You might say, that was foolish. But you don't ask yourself, now that I have lost $20, what am I not going to buy? That's interesting. That's the psychology of abundance. The psychology of abundance is the feeling, the lack of a budget constraint in some bizarre way. You obviously have a budget constraint. If you buy this cocktail, obviously there is something you're not going to buy. But it's a physical budget constraint. It's not a psychic budget constraint. Now let me show you some data of what we did in the US, we asked people to spontaneously answer this question. You're thinking of buying a television. What do you think of? And here you have two different groups. And it's a little bit, when I say high SES, a lot of the people here, given when we did this survey, are also probably a bit financially constrained, but let's just take this cut. And what I've listed here, this is an open-ended question. What I've listed here is the percentage of people in this open-ended question who spontaneously list if I buy this, what will I not be able to buy instead? In other words, those who report a physical budget constraint. And notice the poor are much more likely to ask that question of themselves. That already tells you something. The process, the mental process of choice is very different when you're poor than when you're rich. And this is the same data. 
Done, same question, done now in India. And on the right, this is done for what's called a mixie, basically a blender. And you'll notice, you'll see a big difference. Make the item very expensive, so a TV for low-income Indians, rural Indians, and all of a sudden, the gap disappears. For big enough items, we become poor again, which makes some sense. If you, if you say, if I said you're not thinking of buying a $10 cocktail, you're thinking of buying a $50,000 car, for some of you, all of a sudden, you'll engage in trade-off thinking as well. Not all of you, I suspect. Here's another fact that the poor are different than the rich. Well, actually, here, I'll, I'll finish the, the story. Imagine you have your meal. This is why no one eats with me, I suspect. But imagine you have your meal, and you close the menu, and then after you've ordered, I say to you, what did you just order? Almost all of you will, will know what you just ordered. If I ask you, what did it cost? I mean, you may have a guess, because you know the kind of restaurant it is. But many of you will have no clue. That's also interesting. You really are not focusing on this task. You don't really, I mean, you go, you buy stuff, and afterwards, and in fact, you see this. Here's a very funny, we did this survey in South Station in Boston, where we asked low-income individuals and high-income individuals, when you get into a taxi in Boston, what is the fare? You know, it starts at a certain number. And high-income individuals who are much more likely to use the taxi are less likely to know. And low-income individuals are much more likely to know. And this is, this is striking, because these guys don't use the taxi very much. And you can do this study in many different ways. You can go to a supermarket, and this actually you can do for fun. You go to a supermarket, you stand outside, and you say to people, as they're coming outside, hey, I'd like to do a little survey with you. I'll give you, you know, whatever. People, you know, Saturday afternoon, what else do they have to do? They say yes. You take their receipt, and you say to them, hey, by the way, I noticed you bought Colgate toothpaste. How much did it cost? The rich are like, I don't know, it's $2, $4, something. I know it's less than 10, more than one. Um, and you ask the poor, they know what the price of items are. You ask people, how much did your whole purchase cost? The rich will be like, I think I paid 80, maybe 120. I know it was less than 200, and I know it was much more than 50. But it's somewhere in there. The poor will know, because the poor are actually engaging in the trade-off and making the choices. Here's another version of this. This is a classic problem. Once you start to realize the poor fundamentally take their decision process differently, you'll start to see that very basic principles in psychology that we took as granted don't seem to hold up anymore. Here's, uh, here's some interesting evidence along these lines. Most of you have probably seen leather jacket calculator. This is a version of leather jacket calculator. Here's how it works. You, you can do this with any undergraduate class. It works very well. You say, you know, imagine a friend goes to buy an appliance priced at $100. Let's, pick, let's stick to 100 Although the store's prices are good, the clerk informs your friend that the same item at a store 45 minutes away is $50 less. Should the person go buy it or not? Well, $50 savings on 100 seems pretty good. Most people will say yes. Give another group of people the same question and replace 100 with 1,000. What weirdo is going to go 45 minutes to save $50 on a $1,000 purchase? Makes no sense. So a consistent pattern in, that you find with these type of questions is that you can get almost everybody to say that the $50 savings they would go 45 minutes for when it's off a small base, but not when it's off a big base. Well, obviously that's ludicrous if you take standard choice theory, because 50 is 50 and 45 minutes is 45 minutes. Who cares what the base is? Well, in fact, here's another place where, and you can see this, these are the high SES people. Off a high reference point, they never do it. Off a low reference point, they do it a lot. They'll, they'll go the 45 minutes to say 50. Try this with the poor, they're not affected by the frame. So this classic finding in psychology just doesn't work for the poor. They act much more like the rational economic agent. So look at what all of this data is saying. It's saying the poor are more rational than you and me. Much better at making choices than you and me. Which makes sense. Money matters more to them than it does to you and me. So that's the first observation. So there's an analogy here which can make some sense in your own life, which I want to come back to in a second, which is um, with time. So what's happening is money, when it's so scarce, is really drawing your attention. You want to do well by it. You don't have much of it. You and I can afford not to know the price of toothpaste. Who cares? We've got gobs of money. When you don't have much money, you have to make it work. Similarly, think about the following. This is, well, I'll skip this just in the interest of time because I don't need to tell you the study. 
When you have very little time, for example, when you have a deadline, like let's say you have a talk today, all of a sudden you're remarkably productive when there's eight hours left in a way that you weren't when there's 58 hours left or 78 hours left. See, I want you to keep that intuition in mind is that when you are very busy or when you have very little time, in a way you too become better with time, much like the poor become better with money. Okay, so how do we model this? I think there's an easy way to think about this. One metaphor I've used is imagine packing a, a suitcase for a long vacation, and, or sort of for a short vacation, let's say, and you either have a small suitcase or a big suitcase. And the big suitcase is big enough to hold everything you need. When you have the big suitcase, what do you do? You throw in everything you need. You don't really think too much about it. If there's some other thing and you say, well, well I need you know, running shoes, yeah, whatever, put it in. Maybe, maybe not. And then when you're, you know, the suitcase is pretty well full, and then you close it. If you forget something, you open it and throw in something else. If you have a small suitcase, well, you make a bunch of trade-offs. If I take running shoes, I can't take this. Which one is worth more? I figure it all out. I pack the suitcase extremely carefully. I get it all working really well. That's one way to think about this is, and I, that's why I'm going to call this behavior of the poor packing. When you have a very small suitcase, you have to pack very carefully. You have to make the trade-offs. You have to fit all the items because you don't have much room for error. And there's a very simple economic model that will help make sense of this, which is imagine you are consuming, and you're going to choose an amount of consumption C. That's the dollars you spend. An epsilon of it is lost due to misspending. You bought something too expensive. You bought something you don't really like, whatever it is. Who does epsilon hurt more? Well, it's clear. The same unit of epsilon hurts the poor much more than the rich. That's diminishing marginal utility. Right? So the idea that errors are more consequential is a trivial implication of diminishing marginal utility. There's another implication here which I want to point out, which is also trivial. In economics, this thing and what C is, is totally irrelevant. This could be about how you're spending your time. This could be how about how you're going to spend your calories on a budget. So in some sense, this just says scarcity very generally speaking, when diminishing marginal utility operates, leaves less room for error when you have less of something than when you have more of something. Okay. All this is fine and well, but I'm sure most of you in the back of your mind, even if you don't want to admit it, are thinking to yourself, but come on. You know the poor screw up a lot more. This data is intriguing because the poor are doing so well, better than you and me. But the reality is there are other things where they do much worse than you and me. And so what's going on? And I want to talk about one such example with, that we, in work we've done with Dean Carlin, that Dean and I have done. And I'm emphasizing this because I wanted to start by telling you how good the poor are at doing something to illustrate how sharp the contrast then becomes when they are very bad at something. So here's an example of where they're very bad at, is uh, credit and borrowing. So this is an example of data from vegetable vendors. Um, that I always tell people that you really, to do a real development talk, you have to have a picture of a poor person. And so that, that's a poor person. <laughs> um, now, th and this is, these are vendors are interesting because these are women who buy vegetables and fruits early in the morning. They take them, they sell them throughout the day, and then that's their net profit. They might have bought 1,000 rupees of fruit, sold it for 1,100 rupees, now they made 100 rupees of profit. And what's interesting about these vendors is, how did they get the 1,000 rupees in the first place? A big percentage of them, about 70%, got these 1,000 rupees through a loan. And that loan is pretty simple. They go in the morning, and it can be an actual loan, or it could be buying on credit. But they get those 1,000 rupees on credit. And then, at the end of the day, they pay back, they pay back the 1,000 plus interest. In this case, the interest is roughly 5% per day. So 5% per day means of their... 1,000 rupees, they pay 50 rupees in interest. So their 100 rupees of earnings, half of it is cut and goes to credit, uh, goes to interest payments. That's pretty striking. When you live on two, you know, $2 a day, to have half of it go to interest is pretty striking. Now you could ask yourself, why are the interest rates so high, blah, blah, but let's put that aside for a second. There's a funny fact about these women, which is 5% a day is so big that if this woman simply just self-financed, that is, if she put aside three rupees a day, and those three rupees, she bought uh, her own fruit with those three rupees and let it compound. In 30 days, she'd be debt free. So in 30 days of just drinking one less a cup of tea, she would double her income. That's crazy. 
That's incredible myopia if you're not engaging in that task. So why might you not be engaging in that task? So that's the first example of a puzzle. Now, in this puzzle, you might have plenty of explanations in the back of your mind. Maybe financial literacy is a problem. Maybe she doesn't have access to a savings device. But what I want to argue to you is, I think something much more profound is going on, something much more basic. And to do that, I'm going to show you an interesting experiment we ran. Keep in mind that once we're talking about scarcity, I can do anything I want with scarcity. So we ran a little experiment on Family Feud, where I'm going to try and recreate something like the vendors. Do you all know what Family Feud is? No. Oh, you're really missing out. That is, that is really unfortunate. So when you go home, you should all look up Family Feud on the web. It is the most interesting game show perhaps ever. Um, I'm not, well, except stuff in Japan that's always more interesting. So Family Feud is a game show that is like a quiz show, but most quiz shows are aimed at, I don't know how to say it, but for lack of a better word, um, I don't know, eggheads or people who read the almanac for fun or who know all sorts of stuff and nobody really wants to talk to them. That's why they're on quiz shows. Family Feud tries to create a quiz show that's aimed at like people you know, like, like me, I, I don't know any, I don't know where the capital of Zimbabwe is. I, don't, I, don't, I just learned that Maputo exists. That, that, so what it does is instead of asking factual questions, it asks questions like this. Name something Barbie could sell if she needed to raise money fast. It's an example of a question from family. Barbie is the, the doll, which is all the familiar. <laughs> now, so obviously there's no right answer to this. So how do you get points in Family Feud? Well, 100 people are surveyed. And your job is to guess the most popular answers. So it's the democratization of truth. So it's a great, great, great thing. So here are the answers in case you're curious. Her car, her shoes. Any guess what number three is? Actually, that's number, that's number three is the shoes. Number two? Ken. Yes. <laughs> Good job. It is Ken. And Barbie doesn't even make the top six. So that's good for America, I guess. So here's what we did. We ran a little experiment where we took Princeton undergraduates and we um, had them play many, many rounds of Family Feud. Okay? And they got points for the amount of money, uh, uh, they got money for the amount of points they earned over all, say, 25 rounds. Okay? Or how many other rounds they managed to finish. So that's the game. Now in this game, some subjects were made rich. What does rich mean? For each round they got lots of time. 50 seconds. Some subjects were made poor. What does that mean? They got 25 seconds per round. Okay? So that's how I recreated poverty in Family Feud. And of course, it's no surprise that um, the rich do better than the poor. That's not surprising. They have more time. Of course they did better. But now here comes a twist. We tried to become our own little money lender in this experiment where we said, why don't we offer these people credit at very high rates? So we crossed this poor rich design with allowing some people to not borrow at all, which is what this chart shows, and some people to borrow at very high interest rates. What does borrow mean? You can get an extra second this round, but you give up two seconds from future rounds. That's 100% interest rate. So let's see what happened. What we found was giving the rich the ability to borrow helps them a little bit. It's not significant. Give the poor the ability to borrow, and they become just like the vendors. They become very poor, and they do worse by being able to borrow. And if you look at the dynamics of their borrowing, they're just like the vendors. They get themselves deeper and deeper into a debt trap. These are the poor. Look at that. They're driving themselves down. And they're driving themselves down. They're paying off old debts. They have very little time, so they borrow again to pay off the old debts, just like the vendors do. Now, that's funny. Financial literacy. I mean, you call this financial literacy. I don't know what it means. These are all Princeton undergrads. They know the rules of the game. We had them play multiple times. There's something about poverty, per se, scarcity, per se, that led the poor here to do significantly worse. So that's the second piece of the puzzle. And here's, here's a fraction of their debt going off to paying old debts. By the end, they're about even a little higher than vendors. 70% of their time is going off to simply paying previous debts. The vendors were at 50% of their income paying off old debts. So what is it that's going on? What I want to do is introduce a distinction that I think I've, proved, I've found helpful. And that distinction is the distinction between packing, making ends meet today, and planning. It's not a great word, but it's the word I'm, I'm going to use for today. What I mean by planning is when you're trying to make ends meet today like the vendor, you've got a bunch of needs in the environment and a certain amount of income that you've got to make things work. Um, planning is 
the reflection, the sitting back and contemplating what are all the things that are going to happen to me in the future? How might this money serve me in the future? How might the things I'm doing today have consequences for later? Planning isn't necessarily so cognitive in what I'm going to do today, partly in the interest of time, but partly because it really doesn't do much, I'm going to include both contemplation, which I think of as a cognitive task, attention, and the ability to, to reflect and think about the future. I've always wanted to have an interesting ringtone, so whoever <laughs> has that, I'd like to talk to you. I, I don't even know how to do that. My ringtone is pretty bad. Can you help me with that, Dan? No? No, damn. Okay. Um, I want Rocky or something like that. So the second possibility, the second feature of looking to the future is the exercise of self-control. So you may know the right thing to do, but it's hard to actually do it. But that's self-control. But both of them have the same effect. It's how much of the future enters into the decision process of the now. Does that make sense to everybody? So when I'm thinking hard about what ought I to do now, how much of its ramifications for the future make its way into the choices that I make today? That's what I'm going to call planning. So they're basically two, two separate activities at a cognitive level or at a psychological level. There's a packing activity, making ends meet today, and a sort of planning activity, which is letting everything from the future interpret into today. Everything I've shown you could be consistent with a simple world in which the poor are good at packing, making ends meet now, but bad at planning. So why would that be? Why would someone be good at packing but bad at planning? Well, I think there's a very simple reason. And I'll show you a few experiments that motivate that reason. So this is, a, this is an experiment. I usually have a video I show, but um, this is almost as fun. This is an experiment you can do. You could do this anytime you want if you have two friends, and I heartily suggest you do it. Uh, Dean had a great conference on financial access. We did this experiment on the participants. I wish we had done it here. You guys would like it. So this experiment involves um, uh, three, uh, three guys. So there's the first guy, so this bearded guy, is the subject. The first guy goes and asks the subject for directions, okay? While the subject is answering him, two other people who work for the experimenter walk between the person asking directions and the person, the subject, carrying a door. And what happens is the guy who is asking swaps with one of those guys. So now a different person is left behind. This guy is not the same as this guy. Okay? Uh, yeah, all white people look the same to me too, but in fact, uh, they, they are very different. This picture is not very good. These people are very distinct looking. One guy's big, one guy's small, and you can do this for very distinct looking people. And what you find, and this, there are experiments that are so good you can replicate them. This is easy to replicate. Many people can't tell the distinction. They just continue giving directions. So, you know, you're giving directions, some guy goes, new guy comes, oh yeah, you keep going this way. They have no idea that things have changed. And it works great. We did, this, we did this at Dean's conference where we had subject, people like you would come in for the conference to get some the conference materials. Somebody would duck under to pick up the materials. A new person would get up and hand the materials. And most people just went right along. So psychologists call this change blindness. I think that name is a bit misleading or quite a bit misleading. It's because in a way, I think it's misleading because this word blindness indicates something odd about the world as if you ought to have noticed this. Why would you notice this? You're receiving millions and millions of stimuli every single second. The brain works well by not noticing. Of course, you have a limited amount of attention and you have to turn it to one thing or another. The fact that you didn't process the exact look of this person who's asking you for directions, it's not obvious that that's a bad, I mean, it's not obvious, it's a blindness. It's not a failure, it's a feature of the mind. And this feature of the mind is the feature I want you to think about, which is the cognitive and psychic resources are finite. This experiment shows you one way in which they're finite. You can't notice everything at all times. <coughs> Here's another way in which they're finite. This is another attention task. This is called a dichotic listening task, also very fun to do if you want to do it. You can put on a headphone, and you have people listen to uh, sound, um, sort of like stories or you know, words coming in. And there is one person reading one thing on this end and one person reading something else on this ear. And you ask people to track, say, the right ear. Does that make sense to everybody? And what the brain is remarkably good at doing, almost by force, has to do, is much of the input on this left ear is completely ignored. You can ask people questions about it. They have no idea what it said. You can do things like change certain things in that ear and no one will hear. 
attention, you know this, I don't need to tell you, this is obvious, attention is fundamentally limited. Here's another version of these experiments that shows you the finiteness of it all. In this experiment, subjects are sitting there, uh, well, sorry, before they sit there, they're asked to remember uh, a number. They're told you're going to have a little memory test. Okay? Some people are given a two-digit number, pretty easy, and some people are given a seven-digit number, harder. And then, while they're trying to make sure they remember this number, they, they're sitting at a place where they have a choice between cake and fruit. Okay? And what happens is, those people who are busy using cognitive resources, trying to make sure they remember the number, are much more likely to choose the cake than those who are using not using as many cognitive resources. This makes sense. These resources are finite. You can either use the resources to remember the number or to control yourself and not eat the cake. If you're using it for one, you can't use it for the other. This is a very basic feature. We all, as economists, should embrace this. It says that scarcity is not just a feature of the physical world. It's a feature of the mental world. Our mental resources are as finite as our physical resources. Well, once you agree to that, then things start to become really trivial. Okay, so let me write down this model for you. Which is, since psychic resources are finite, using psychic resources for one activity leaves less for another activity. Obviously, if you use resources in packing, you have less resources to use in planning. So is it a surprise when put that way, that the poor are good packers but bad planners? Not really, if you think of it that way. So let me tell you how you might write this model. Imagine you have a packing activity, which is, like I said, U of C minus epsilon. And you can devote, you can devote cognitive or psychic resources, alpha, to reducing that epsilon. So the more you think about it, the lower the error in packing. There's the future, delta V of Y minus C. This is your returns from saving or contemplating the future. The more cognitive resources you put beta to that, the more of the future enters into your calculus. So that what people are basically maximizing is U of C minus epsilon alpha plus beta delta V of Y minus C. And this is the cognitive constraint now on top of the usual income constraint that alpha plus beta equals one. Does that make sense to everybody? And now here's a trivial thing. If you even make an extreme model, I'm not, I don't necessarily buy this model, but let's take an extreme model. You have a planner who's perfectly rational and who has to choose alpha and beta, how the cognitive resources ought to be divided. You can see that what ends up happening is that because of diminishing marginal utility, the planner, when, consum when people are poor, will choose a higher alpha. They'll put more resources into packing. And when people are rich, they'll put less resources into packing and more resources into planning. So a model like, I'm not going into great detail, but this has a pretty trivial implication. As income goes up, packing quality drops and planning quality rises. Ironically, this will lead the rich to look more patient and look more thoughtful. They'll look worse about packing today. You'll look foolish because you don't know the price of toothpaste. But in general, you'll look like you're more farsighted just because you have the freedom to think about the future. And this has a few hypotheses. This kind of says, in a funny way, the poor will look very good at all of the things involving packing. And I don't know anyone who's done this, but like we redid Leather Jacket Calculator, this model predicts that a bunch of different judgment decision-making biases that we've documented on the poor, not all, but a, but a variety of them that have to do with the packing today, the poor should actually do much better at than the rich. So there's kind of a, a very straightforward implication. Let me just show you a few more implications of this, which are kind of also straightforward. If you iterate this over time, you end up with a very different kind of poverty trap in this model. Because the poor pack well, but they plan poorly, they're left in a position with even less income tomorrow, which makes them even more frantic to have to pack well today, leaving them with less cognitive resources for planning. And so as a result, you get a very extreme kind of poverty trap in which there be, when you start at low levels of income, you actually are pushed down, much like the vendors, into a situation where the current situation actually occupies a lot of cognitive resources and keeps you very poor. Okay, this obscures something, so I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence that it obscures, and then we'll talk through. What it obscures, and this is what I'm struggling with right now, is that everything I've put makes you feel like it's some you know, decision, am I going to think about today, I'm going to think about the future, you know, what am I going to do? That misses something very fundamental, I think, about the psychology of scarcity, and I want to show you these results and then we'll move on. What that misses is, go back to this, this task I had people listening to two earphones, okay? Uh, two streams coming into their ear. 
It turns out that if one of the streams, the one you're not listening to, says, Sendel, well, your name, whatever that might be, I assume it's not Sendel, that, no matter if you were intently focused on this other ear, your attention is pulled away to this ear. These cognitive resources are not something you allocate. They get allocated for you in some situations. Certain things capture your attention. And this kind of illustrates that. You can see hearing, um, I won't go through that table, but you all get this. Here's a version of this from scarcity that I think is particularly interesting. I just want you to understand that this notion that today and the problems of scarcity capture the mind, I think in an economic model, they, it can be thought of as a choice variable, but I think psychologically, it's a much, much more fundamental process. So here's a process that illustrates that. In this study, subjects were brought into the lab and they were uh, told not to drink water for five hours before. So they come in very thirsty. And so like a good psych study, half of them are given water, but half of them are given pretzels. So now they're really thirsty. <laughs> and then they're given a task, and here's the task. It's called a lexical decision task. Have you, do you guys, it's, it's not, many of you might not know this. It's a very nice task for measuring cognition at very fast levels. And here's how it works. Letters come up in front of you, and you have to hit a button if it's a word. And you don't hit the button if it's not a word. RKW, don't hit a button. FAT, hit a button. Okay? And so this happens at 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds range. Okay, that's the speed at which we're looking. And what they did was, they did the lexical decision task for two categories of words. Words that are neutral, chair, trees, talking. Words that have to do with thirst. Water, juice, soda, thirst. <laughs> and you can imagine, the thirsty are very good at finding these words really fast. <laughs> so, though I gave you the notion that attention is something that's allocated, I think probably the right way of thinking of the model I gave you before is that alpha, we can call it a choice variable, but more, a better way to think about it is that scarcity captures your attention. It pulls you in, it locks you in. So there's a distinction here, which I'm not gonna get into too much, but it's a distinction between optimal allocation of psychic resources versus the capture of psychic resources. So you can easily model this, you can, um, actually I'll show you a funny version of this that we did. So this is a version where we gave people this type of task. So you see a grid like this, okay? And then you're asked, where was the cereal box in this grid of six, right? So you're given some time to study this, and then it's a memory task, okay? Now here's the funny part. After doing this with just one, we gave people the task simultaneously. We said, now you're gonna do two grids simultaneously, okay? And again, they just redid it again, except we did a little trick, and the trick was, some subjects have three guesses here, three guesses here. In other words, when they reach this point, they get three guesses to find it. Or, does that make sense? Yeah. Some subjects have one guess here, three guesses here. Some subjects have one guess here, one guess here. So you can imagine what happened. What happens is, when you have one guess and three guesses, guess what you end up focusing disproportionately on? Where there's scarcity. This totally draws your mind. And in a way, when we give people one and three, they do worse than if we give people one and one. That's attentional capture. Scarcity captured your attention here. It wasn't it. If you were optimizing attentional allocation, you would never have one, one beating one, three. But it's capturing you. Okay, that having, that having been said, let's um, tell, so you could easily write this if you want by saying alpha plus beta is not a fixed resource. It's a fixed resource. It's a resource where the amount you have left depends on the marginal utility of consumption. Some of it is captured by today, and that's what you have left to allocate. Okay. Turns out, okay. Let me show you some of the stark implications of this. So first stark implication of this, this struck me, this stri this struck me. We did a study with um, uh, people in a New Jersey mall. What we did was um, we asked them to um, do these two type of tasks. Okay, let's start with this one. Do you guys know what this is? This is the Raven's Progressive Matrix task. When you measure flexible IQ, this is one of the core things you use to measure one component of IQ. So we gave people this task. The other task we gave people is what's called a cognitive control task. It's actually a pretty good measure in other studies to be shown to predict self-control, for example. And it's pretty simple. It's, you see these things flash in front of you 
and you're told whenever you see the heart, when you hit this, the same side as the heart. When you see the flower, you hit the opposite side. So you can see it's challenging because you've got to keep switching modalities. It's because you keep wanting, so when you see the flower, you'll want to hit the flower, but you're told, oh wait, it's a flower, so you have to pull back. So it's the number of errors and speed with which you can do this task turns out to be psych psychologically quite predictive. This is quite predictive of IQ. Okay. So we did this task and we found the rich and the poor are not too different in these tasks. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of sample. If we had more, they probably would have been different, but in the control, they weren't too different. Then we did something else. We said, before we did this task, we asked some of them, if you had to get $1,000 fast, because your car broke down, and we have different examples, how would you get the money? So we had them think about packing. And what we found was, thinking about packing had a big effect now on Raven's performance. This is the rich, above median income. When they had, we did also a financially easy one, which everyone, you know, find $10. But you find that for the rich, when you give them 10 versus 1,000, no difference. Having them think about where money comes from doesn't do anything with their performance. For the poor, when they're forced to ask, where will $1,000 come from? They do significantly worse on Ravens. This is a big drop. In fact, this is an IQ test. The poor, by this measure, in this case, would look significantly lower in IQ. They're dumber. The same on cognitive control. And so you see, this is the alpha versus the beta. It's not just an abstract planning thing. The poor look stupid. Here's a study that um, we've done with Anandi Mani, who's somewhere here, but I can't find Anandi. Um, I guess all Indians look alike. Okay. So here what we did is we did, that was a, a priming experimental task. We tried to replicate something like this in the field. So how would we get exogenous variation in income? Well, there's a useful place with sugarcane farmers. Because the harvest money comes in once a year, the same farmer is rich post-harvest and poor pre-harvest. And these are well enough off farmers that nutrition doesn't change that much. So we're not finding a nutrition cognitive effect. But in fact, your expenditures do change quite a bit and borrowing from the money lender, pawning items, these things change. Pre-harvest are tight times for the farmer, and post-harvest are easy times for the farmer. And an interesting thing about this is that the harvest dates are staggered. So you can run a survey where you survey people before and after, take out all the month effects, take out all the person fixed effects. So now we get to see the same person before and after. And in fact, what you find is very similar to the lab study. right? Uh, Post-harvest, these are the amount of errors in a cognitive control task. So lower is better, indicates greater cognitive capacity. And you'll notice less errors post-harvest and more, much more errors pre-harvest. When you calibrate this, this is actually of the magnitude that if you do these tests with inebriated people, you find about this level of difference. So this magnitude of poverty, pre versus post-harvest, has a cognitive effect comparable you know, to being mildly drunk. So what this tells you is this beta term I had illustrates that in fact the poor, by virtue of being poor, just by having little, this is not a person effect because it's the same guy pre and post harvest. And it was the same guy here too in this study. But that the act of being poor taxes cognitive resources for doing much else. Why? Because most of your mind is being trapped by thinking how am I going to make ends meet today? To me this, this has a lot of striking implications. We found this in a variety of data. This is an early study on this. I'll just show you this. Um, I think in this graph it's suggestive, uh, but you'll get the idea. This is the food stamp cycle in the United States. It's well known that you, know, you get your food stamps at this type of the month, and at this time of the month, uh, you're short on food. So it's a very stressful time. And you can see the cognitive stress in that sleep levels go way down at the, at the beginning, at the, Sleep levels go way down at the end of the month relative to the beginning of the month. And sleep is usually a good biomarker for uh, cognitive stress. Um, here's perhaps the most striking of these that we found. This is the earned income tax credit cycle. It's like the harvest cycle for the poor in the US. Basically what ends up happening is that you get a pretty big payment uh, here, okay? March or April. The tax return comes in, and in the US it's a negative income tax. So the poor get a big amount of money. And these dash populations are the ones who get, who get the pretty big amount of money. 
why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because if you were to do the harvest cycle, these months are very easy months, going around here. These months are very hard months. So what is on this y-axis? Well, there's a biological literature that suggests that kind of cognitive load and stress has an impact on, um, for pregnant women, has an impact on male fetuses. Male fetuses are killed uh, at a high rate in the first trimester if the mother is stressed. And so here you can see, if we track the babies that were in the womb during these months, relative to these months, many more of them are females than in the months after the harvest payment comes in, uh, after the harvest, earned income tax credit payment comes in. And that's really only true of this category. There's really no time series in these other categories. So you're getting a sense that we're trying to triangulate using a lot of measures that there really is quite a bit of variation in load, IQ, capacity, stress, as a, purely as a function of poverty. And this is, yeah, so you guys, you guys see this. This is percentage males, basically. Okay. I want to show one last thing, which is I talked about packing and planning. I just want to point a third activity, which also uses cognitive resources, which is doing. A lot of life isn't about making decisions about finances. You're just doing stuff. You're working. You're parenting. You're doing a lot of stuff. All of those require cognitive resources too. So if alpha and you're getting a tax of your cognitive resources <coughs> that are being used up, well, there'll be much less left for the actual act of doing. So I'll give you an example of this. This is a study that we ran with another group of people experiencing scarcity, and these are dieters. And so what we did was um, we had them do these word searches, just an activity completely unrelated to scarcity in any way. And they had to find the word street, or tree, or picture, or cloud. And they got paid for how quickly they found them. Another half of the subjects did the same thing, but instead of street, they were looking for the word cake. The word tree stayed the same. But the next word has been changed from picture to donut. We replaced every other word with a nice, tasty word, like cake, donut, sweets, dessert. OK? So what were we interested in? We were interested in how quickly was the word, let's say, cloud, which is the same across both conditions, found when the subjects saw the word picture recently or they saw the word donut recently. And it turned out that for most subjects, it didn't make a difference. If you just saw picture or donut, you found cloud at the same rate, except for one group of people. And that group of people was the dieters. For dieters, if they just saw the word donut, they were much slower at found it, finding the word cloud because their mind was still on the donut. <laughs> and you kind of know this. You know this when you're trying to work and something is on your mind. You're just less effective at this thing because your mind keeps going back to that thing. So <clears throat> here's an example of this. Go back to the food stamp stuff that we found. These are differences in disciplinary actions on children. These are not children, like high school students. Either the building is moving or, wow, that is awesome. <laughs> I, really, I really thought we were being trucked away somewhere. It happens every day. It happens every day, exactly. It's great. Talk about divided attention. Um, so these are food stamp recipients, non-food stamp recipients. These are the sort of high school students. Near the end of the food stamp month, you can see their disciplinary actions against them in school go up significantly. Much more, happen, much more than happens with non-food stamp recipients. I'm just trying to go between the lab and the field. What I'm trying to illustrate with all of this is that, to conclude on this, because poverty results in fewer psychic resources, I want to say the poor will look better in one domain in life. They'll look better when it comes to packing. Ask them what they just spent, they'll know what they just spent. But ironically, because they're better packers, they'll look worse at all of these other domains. They'll be worse planners. They'll be worse at doing stuff. They'll look less productive. They'll be worse workers. They'll be worse parents. Why? Because being a parent requires some psychic resources to actually be a good parent. In some sense, what will end up happening is this will we'll have a poverty trap like the one outlined below before, but it's a poverty trap in which the poor will be left not just poor and lacking in money, but actually lacking in psychic resources. They'll look like they're dumber, they have less IQ, they'll look like they have less self-control, they'll just look ineffectual. They're not ineffectual, as you saw in the Harvest study. The same person, give them income, boom, the person changes. So it's nothing intrinsic to the person. So where I've kind of come back full circle is 
maybe I was wrong to dismiss these 19th century, 20th century, the unspoken part of psychology and poverty. Maybe I was wrong to dismiss the notion that the poor are actually worse. I dismissed it because there was an implicit presumption that all of those scholars had, which is that the poor are worse people. They're not worse people. In no way, at least in this analysis. It's simply poverty makes everybody, no matter who you are, put into those circumstances, have less of these psychic resources. Okay, so let me just conclude on the fact that, here, I'll skip this, even though I don't even know how fast I can skip this. These are just examples of the way the poor look worse. But we don't have time for that. Okay, so let me conclude on this. I think this has some pretty, uh, uh, for me at least, very useful pro, uh, policy design implications, which I hadn't thought of. The first program design feature is that, I think of this as a phrase, we often don't realize how many of our programs have psychic taxes embedded in them. What do I mean by a psychic tax? Which is, to access the program requires some psychic resources. If it's a financial literacy program, you're asking me to sit there for six hours and concentrate. That's a psychic tax. Psychic taxes are often embedded at a much more basic level. Sometimes you hold a vaccination camp all the way you know, somewhere else, and you're asking somebody to plan, to follow through, to show up at this location to get the vaccination. In effect, a lot of these, these um, programs use psychic capital. But one thing to think of is the fact that what I've just shown you is after you take away the alpha, the beta that's left for these programs, the poor have less than the rich. So psychic taxes are inherently regressive. Much like you would never charge a lot of money to use a program, you ought to ask, should I be charging a lot in psychic taxes to use the program? So a lot of the literature that's emerging, and the way I think about it, these sort of nudge literature, where you reduce psychic taxes, you make the program easier to use, you make it, not all of it, but some of it, I think can be interpreted as saying nudges are not just generally useful, they're particularly useful for the poor, that they will have disproportionate impact on this population. Another, implement, another um, feature of this that's worth thinking about is that if you know people have fewer cognitive resources for planning, then programs that supplement low beta will be particularly effective. So for example, if you take the same harvest payment, instead of paying it out annually, you actually pay it out monthly. That's a program where you've actually changed, even if I don't actually put resources into planning, the planning has already been implicitly done for me in the way the thing is being paid out. That type of restructuring will have quite a large effect on the poor relative to the rich. The other thing which I had never really thought of is that many of the products that we think of as helpful for solving behavioral problems, which will actually be helpful to the poor, will have low take up by the poor. So let me use an example here of self-control devices. I come and offer you a commitment device that helps you save in the future. Now that device will be helpful because you have low beta, but what do you need to analyze that offer? Cognitive resources to figure out, is this offer good for me? So ironically, you have this situation where the poor need that more, but it's also taxing them in exactly such a way that they'll have to invest in the resource that they need to do that. Okay. There's a final implication which is much more positive than the rest of this, which is notice in this model, the tax, the amount of alpha being taken away from cognition, varies with U prime today. What that means, like we saw in the Harvest study, is that the same person is more cognitively capable and more psychically capable sometimes than at other times. Imagine you're writing an HIV program where you'd like to go and teach people on the importance of HIV. When would be a good time to have that program? before harvest or after harvest. It's a mild change, but it's not a feature that we think of because we think of the cognitive resources, well, they're not fixed. The effect of cognitive resources vary a lot over time. And as a result, this basically, just what's, I, I don't have time to go into all the policy implications, but the perspective that has helped me kind of understand is to think of this resource that a lot of our programs use and think about when is it most available and can I use it efficiently, much like I would do with money or any other scarce resource. Okay, let me stop there. Thanks.